it's Mr. Frost coming to you today to talk about stress and the psychology of stress. Um, I know this was a topic that some people mentioned they wanted to hear about, and I think it's super relevant. So I want I want to do this in two parts. I'm going to briefly cover um, an overview of stress, what it is, how we respond to it, and then tomorrow I will talk about ways that we can combat stress or cope with stress. So we'll kind of do two little mini videos about this. Um, stress is a big topic in psychology. There's whole sections and units committed to it. Um, so if you want to know more, please let me know. But for the sake of these videos, I thought I'd kind of keep it short and simple and we could be straightforward so um let me move my little cool circle up here i love this app you can like move this and make it bigger and smaller it's so fun uh anyway so let's start with just a basic definition it's always good to have a good working definition so uh stress is a physical and psychological response to events known as stressors that disrupt our normal functioning so we can see a wide range of things that can disrupt our normal functioning in response to um things that are happening in the environment. And when I say environment, I'm not talking about like trees, but I mean like anything outside of your body that happens. Um, there's also eustress, which is a moderate or normal stress that can actually benefit you. So maybe it helps you write a paper better or faster. That's considered a good positive type of stress. And stress is normal, right? Everyone experiences stress, all human beings have always experienced stress, so it's not something you should feel ashamed of if you get stressed out. That's just a normal part of being a human. So when we refer back to those stressors that I talked about in the slide before, um, you can think about any physical or psychological challenge that threatens your normal functioning. So this could range from physical things. So like for me, heat can be a stressor. When it gets really hot, um, it stresses me out. Uh, I get uncomfortable. I get headaches. Um, I, it's hard for me to function and engage with people because that is something that, that causes uh, stress to me. And that looks different for everyone, obviously, depending on your genetics. And then, of course, how you were raised, that will indicate how you might respond to different stressors. There's also psychological stressors like conflict in a relationship or a traumatic life event. Those are types of things that could cause stress as well. So a question for you, and you can pause the video and talk about this if you're watching it with your parent or sibling, or you can just write it down if you're on your own. Um, what types of stressors has the current pandemic brought into your life? So I'll give an example. Uh, I wrote on these little whiteboards. I wrote in advance to save us some time, and I thought it'd be less messy. It, my handwriting still is just really not that good, but that's okay. Uh, so the stressor that I talked about, let me make myself bigger. Boom is uh, social interaction was lost. So that's me, and that's Mrs. Howman. And if you know, I, I always talk about how she's the greatest teacher to ever live and all those types of things, which I think is true. Um, but I was so used to being able to say good morning to her, and she would say, hi, neighbor, or you know, we'd reverse that conversation, however it goes. But having that nice, positive daily interaction always really made my day better. I knew at any time I could go over and talk to her and get advice or just bounce ideas off of her. If you've ever seen me leave class for like 15 seconds that I was going next door to get some advice from Ms. Howe when you're figuring out how to approach a situation. She's always just available and welcome. And this pandemic has made it so that I don't get to see her every day and have that really nice positive social interaction. So that's been one example of a stressor for me. And obviously it's gonna range for you all. You might have a similar one or there's a certain friend that you saw all the time, um, or it could be something else that you lost as a result of this pandemic. But that's an example of one stressor that has um, come into my life as a result of this pandemic. So when a stressor comes into our lives, we do two things. It's a two-step process, and it's called an appraisal. Um, people who work with loans and things might do appraisals. So if you have parents who work in real estate or something, this is a term they probably know. Um, and so we have a primary appraisal. So we have to figure out, okay, is this new stressor a threat to us? And if so, is it a big threat or a small threat to how we normally function? Is this going to throw us way off track or is this like going to be a minor thing that we can just deal with? OK, then we have a secondary appraisal and this is us deciding how we're going to cope with this certain stressor. So the example that I want us to do is you find out that your best friend doesn't want to be in your prom group anymore. OK, so there's going to be a primary appraisal. There's going to be a first thing. And if you want to pause here and talk about this with the person next to you, that'd be great. 
or you can write it down, however, and then just continue when you want to. Uh, but now would be a good time to do that and think about that. What would that primary appraisal look like and what would that secondary appraisal look like? Now that you're done pausing, because I assume you did, and you did this little activity, that's okay if you didn't, uh, I wrote an example of my primary. So my primary, that's me. I'm a little sad, but I've decided, you know, there's other good people in that group, so I think I'll get over it, and I'll just have fun with them. And then in my secondary appraisal, my coping mechanism was, I'm just going to have fun with the people who want to be with me, okay? And um, what's important to know is that that appraisal can change. That's not a one-step process. You may decide initially that it's okay, but later on, you may reappraise and you figure out, man, that sucks and I don't think I can go to the dance. Or you get to the dance and you see your friend and you are stressed out and your your palms get sweaty and your, starts heart, your heart starts beating. And for my nature nurture people, which part of your nervous system is involved in that? If you said sympathetic nervous system, you are correct. <laughs> and getting your heart to beat and getting those, getting your memory, it's moving your body to action. It's exciting. It's causing something. Um, so that might be something that happens too. So those appraisals can change sometimes. It just depends. In our brain, what appraisal looks like is our amygdala and our hippocampus, amongst other brain structures, are involved in that appraisal. Okay. So our amygdala is our emotion center. If you think of inside out, we're like joy and um, sadness. We're all together. And when something happened, they were responding to it. That actually happens. So if you want to go watch inside out now that you know a little more about it, you can just think of like, hey, that's my amygdala. Um, it stores memories of our past stressors. And it also stores how we respond to them. So in the future that we can respond to them faster and better if a similar stressor comes up. So that's why we say um, when we study memory in class, we'll talk about how emotions can make a memory stronger. And that's part of the reason why is that our amygdala comes into play and helps make that memory stronger. So the example that I've given is um, I, sometimes I get sad at work. Sometimes work makes me sad. Either I'm overwhelmed or something bad happens or someone says something that really kind of makes me feel sad. Um, and so when that happens, that's a stressor. But one of the ways that I deal with that is I look at really nice notes from students, whether it's current students or past students, and that kind of helps me deal with that sadness and deal with that stressor. Okay, so um, my amygdala remembers how I felt when that negative thing happened related to work, but it also remembers how good it felt to read those notes, and it stores that in my memory. And it says, hey, hippocampus, can you please lock that away in long-term memory so that Jordan does not forget how he feels when something bad happens to him at school? And he remembers what those notes made him feel like. Something else that our hippocampus could do is say, it's probably important to remember what those notes said, so you don't always need to look at them to be able to have that positive feel. Okay, so we also have these psychological conflicts. I think this is so fun. So this is when there's a choice that is required between two different things or multiple things, and it seems like those things are incompatible, okay? So there's four types of these conflicts, and we'll run through each of them. The first one is called approach, approach. So this is when a person has to choose between one of two attractive goals, meaning, man, both of these are pretty good, and I have to make a decision. So here, let's look at this picture that I've drawn for approach, approach. Where's approach, approach? Here's approach, approach. So on one side is this wonderful young lady saying, hey, let's go get ice cream at 8. On this other side is three of my friends saying, hey, let's play Madden at 8. I am like, I like ice cream. And I like her, but it's at 8 o'clock. And I'm like, wow, my friends are cool and they're funny, and I love Madden, but it's also at 8 o'clock. I now have to make a decision between two positive things, and that can be difficult to decide. That introduces stress because you have to make a decision one way or the other. Okay, So that's one example, one of the conflicts. The other conflict is... Avoidance, avoidance. <laughs> so this is when there's two things that are kind of unattractive options, 
lesser of two evils, if you think. In the 2016 election, a lot of people said, oh, it's the lesser of two evils. That would be an example of avoidance, avoidance. So the picture that I drew for avoidance, avoidance is, and to all the moms out there, please don't get mad at me for this. Um, I think you all are wonderful and the heroes of our society. But I'm going to use you in this example. Um, so here's mom in the middle. Okay. And mom's giving you two choices. She says, you can either do the dishes or babysit your little brother. You have a choice. And you're like, man, doing the dishes sucks. But then you're also like, but he is annoying. Okay. And here he is saying, ha, 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 you have to watch me. Right. Neither of these really are like winning, like super positive, great things that you want to do. They don't pass the vibe check. I think I used that right. Um, but you have to choose one because your mom's not going to let you get away with it. So that's an example of avoidance, avoidance. Okay. Then we have approach avoidance. Now, approach avoidance is exactly how it sounds. If you think of the previous two, approach is a goal that has um, positive and positive attributes and avoidance is something that's unattractive when you're in an approach avoidance situation it means that that one thing has a positive to it and a negative to it so here's the example your friends are like hey let's go to this party that is the approach but then your dad would be really really sad if you went to that party he wouldn't approve of you being there with those people so that is the avoidance. Now you in the middle have to make a choice knowing that you're either going to upset your friends who really want you to come hang out or you're going to disappoint your dad who really doesn't want you to be with that group of people at that party. Okay, you have to make a tough choice. And then we have double approach avoidance. So let's say you're deciding what college you want to go to. Here you are and you might want to go to UW or WSU. So the uh, avoidance for UW is that it's kind of an average school. You know, it's like, it's okay. They do some things well, uh, whatever. Um, but they're in a big city. And for you, that's a big approach. For WSU, the approach is that it's the greatest university that's ever existed. But an avoidance could be that it's kind of in the middle of nowhere and a bunch of wheat fields. Okay, so that's an example of their approach avoidance. You ultimately have to make a choice between the two. But both of them have positive and negative features. Okay, so you can see how we've just seen the examples. Those could cause some stress because you have to make a choice, and there are some pros and cons that you have to weigh with some of those things. Here's some other types of stressors. I won't talk about all of them, but you can see how there's a bunch of these different types of things that could cause stress in our lives. And if you want to pause again and talk about this with someone, um, think about which of these stressors that the coronavirus might fall underneath. And are there multiple? Because there are multiple. But think about which of these um, have been impacted by the coronavirus. And then we have our psychological response to stress. So I'm putting this into three categories, emotional, cognitive, and behavioral. Okay, And we can see that each of these has a different role to play when we are stressed. Let me move my little bubble up to this corner here. So emotional responses to stress could be crying. You could just be so stressed out that you're crying. Um, you can become really nervous or irritable or just apathetic and like, I don't care anymore. I'm not going to do anything. Um, some cognitive things could be memory problems, trouble concentrating or being distracted. And then behavioral, you could have trouble in relationships, alcohol or substance abuse can get involved, compulsive eating. So these are all examples or signs that you could look for if someone's really stressed. And what's important to know is that some of these things, um, you can learn to control them and cope with them. But without those strategies, you actually don't know how. And sometimes you can become so numb that you just stop interacting at all because you're just the stress has overwhelmed you. So uh, reflecting on today, I, I want you to think about what you've learned today, what we've talked about. Can you make any connections between today's content and what is going on in your life with the current pandemic? Let me know what you think. Let me know if you see some connections. And then tomorrow we'll talk about um, ways to cope with stress, how we can actually deal with the stress that happens in our lives. Thanks for tuning in, and I hope you watch again tomorrow.